Tonight, the historic rainfall in California, rushing a crown jewel inside Yosemite National Park back to life. After five inches of rain Sunday, the falls roaring again tonight. California slowly awakening from a year-long extreme drought as an atmospheric river dumps record rain across the state. Previously parched cities like San Francisco and Sacramento shattering records. Some communities seen more than 12 inches of rain. And tonight, thousands of miles across the country, a nor'easter is bearing down on the East Coast. Our Rob Marciano timing up a double threat. The breaking news tonight, the shooting at a Boise, Idaho mall. What we're learning about what happened. The race for an infrastructure deal before President Biden's critical trip to Europe. Far outside Washington, tonight, the Americans with a message to lawmakers caught in the crosshairs of the lengthy debate in Congress. People live on the other side of that bridge. Not only does it affect us getting our crop out, but it affects the normal everyday, you know, business. New developments tonight after that deadly movie set shooting in Santa Fe involving Alec Baldwin. A crew member detailing the moments leading up to the tragedy, publicly accusing the producers of negligence. Our conversation with the Hollywood industry veteran who has been responsible for guns and ammunition on movie and TV sets for more than 20 years. Facebook under fire again, even as earnings do better than expected. Whistleblower Francis Haugen testifying again, this time before members of the British Parliament today. Thousands of leaked documents show employees angry and frustrated at the company, accusing it of spreading misinformation and calls for violence. It's one of the most remote places on the planet and one of the coldest. But deep in Siberia, something is happening to permafrost that has implications for all of us. We're about 12 meters underground here in the permafrost, and it's cold. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. We begin tonight with America under fire, another deadly mass shooting developing as we come on the air as the country's gun crisis continues. All this month, we're looking at gun violence in America, at least 351 killed by gun violence in just this past week. Tonight, authorities in Boise, Idaho, say at least six people were shot, including a police officer at a mall. One suspect is in custody tonight. This comes as we continue to seek new details about how someone could die from a prop gun on a movie set fired by Alec Baldwin. And in one of America's largest cities, a dramatic rise in murders as has school principals demanding action to stop what they call a war on the streets that is leaving lasting damage to our youth. We have so much to get to tonight, but first we begin with Kena Whitworth and the latest information we're learning out of Boise tonight. Tonight, a deadly shooting sending shoppers running for their lives inside this Idaho mall. Shooting at Boise Town for 350 North Milwaukee, 7 Mason, for the security officer. Police say two people were killed inside the city's largest shopping mall. The primary suspect may have ran by the Dave and Busters wearing dark clothes, also had all black and wearing a backpack. One store worker telling us mall security alerted her and other employees to the shooting. She says they and about a dozen customers then rushed to the back room to hide from the gunman. We went to the pretzel stand to get some pretzels and all of a sudden we heard gunshots. Officers methodically going store by store searching for victims. Authorities now confirming at least one person is in custody. Such a frightening situation there. Kena Whitworth joins us now. Kena, what is the latest at this hour on the investigation? So, Stephanie, we're learning now that one of these injured is, of course, a Boise police officer. And sadly, right now, what they're doing is they are notifying the families of the deceased and of the injured as well. They are giving us an update here. They say right now a majority of this mall has been cleared. They say these shots rang out just before 2, in, two o'clock in the afternoon. And as we mentioned here, they believe it was a single shooter that they do have in custody. And at this point, they don't have any word on motivation. But also, Stephanie, they're investigating two separate crime scenes here. We have the crime scene, of course, inside the mall, but there's another one about a block away that they're still looking into. Police, they're working multiple crime scenes. All right, Kana Whitworth for us. Thank you so much. 
Now to the historic rainfall in California, the atmospheric river soaking the northern part of that state. Some communities that had not seen significant rain for the better part of the year, breaking rainfall records in just a day. Our Will Carr reports. Tonight, powerful winds and historic rainfall lashing the west coast. A potent atmospheric river slamming the region for more than 24 hours, sending mud, trees and boulders crashing down into this California highway. This big rig overturning on the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. Off the Washington coast, the strongest storm on record. East of Seattle, two people killed Sunday when a tree struck their car. Back in California, outside Sacramento, John Sargettis grateful his son is alive. This tree crashing into his son's car just minutes before he was set to go to work. I can't think what would have happened if he was walking up that pathway. Near the San Francisco airport, Trevor Steins' neighborhood underwater. My whole garage is up to my kneecaps. Everything is floating around. In Chicago, winds from a separate system whipping the waters of Lake Michigan, waves over 12 feet. Look at this strong tornado. That storm already dropping more than a dozen reported tornadoes in the heartland over the weekend. One twister northeast of Kansas City tearing apart John and Joellen Duncan's home. We have a basement, but there wasn't time. Once you see the tornado, there's not time to run to the basement. And if we'd have tried, we'd have probably been killed. Millions along the East Coast now in the storm's path, bracing for a potential nor'easter. With that storm system moving east, we've heard a chorus of chainsaws here today. This is a massive cleanup effort that's going on all across the region. And with all that rain, it did put a dent into the drought and the potential for more wildfires. But here in California, we've had fires into December in recent years, so we still have a long way to go. Stephanie. And so much damage there. We can see that tree uprooted there by those storms. Our thanks to Will. Now let's bring in our Rob Marciano, who is tracking the rain on both coasts tonight. Rob, how's it going? Well, Stephanie, this is an impressive storm, a record-breaking storm in the West and the Pacific uh, in terms of its pressure and wind energy and also a record-breaking storm as, as, in terms of its uh, rainfall. The center of it really hasn't made landfall yet. I want to show where you is, where it is right now, heading into British Columbia. But the, really, the atmospheric river that's done all that damage with the rainfall is sliding into Southern California right now. And we've got wind advisories, winter storm warnings posted. It's going to be a, a windy event along with the moisture across the, the mountains over the next couple of days. Meantime, uh, once it gets into the plains, and at least the forward energy of it will do that tomorrow, a pretty good chance of seeing severe weather from Nebraska deep into Texas. Could see some tornadoes also. And here in the east, we're dealing with the energy from last week's western storm in the way of some severe weather threat in across the Carolinas. And that low is going to really uh, tap into some en energy in the Atlantic that will bring in big-time rain during the day tomorrow. Flood watches are posted for New York and not the I-95 area. And this could become a a bit of a nor'easter late tomorrow into Wednesday, and that rainfall and wind will be lingering, especially across the coastlines of New England into the midweek, Stephanie. And Rob, people out west have been hearing about the drought, dealing with the drought for so many months now, but many tonight may hear about these soaking rains impacting many northern California communities and think the extreme drought is over. But is that really the case? Well, definitely not over, Stephanie, but maybe a bit of a dent. I mean, you know, I think for the most part, it's at least shutting down the fire season for, for Northern California. But give you an idea how much rainfall fell. Uh, we saw over five inches in Sacramento after nearly over 200 days of, of no rain, upwards of 10 inches of rain in places like Santa Rosa and also uh, uh, near um, um, Paradise, where that's fires a couple years ago, and six to ten inches there in, along that stretch right there, where they, we've had a couple of, of fire burn scars as well. Lake Oroville, and you may remember, uh, it's been over 250 feet below full with this drought. That's jumped 20 feet at least in the last two days, so that's certainly encouraging. Um, the outlook over the next three months, above average uh, precipitation across the northwest, that doesn't help California too much, and below average temperature uh, uh, precipitation in Southern California, and Southern California, although they're getting rain right now from the system, they're not going to get nearly what Northern California got. So a bit of a dent in Northern California, but Southern California is still an extreme drought. Stephanie. All right, Rob, we know you'll be watching it for us. Thank you so much. You bet. We turn next to more positive news about COVID vaccines and children as Moderna announces their study results finding that a low dose of their vaccine was safe and effective in children 6 to 11 years old. They plan to submit their data to the FDA soon and tomorrow an FDA advisory panel will consider Pfizer's vaccine for children 5 to 11 years old. ABC's Ariel Reshef is tracking it all tonight. 
Just one day before an FDA panel is set to review and rule on Pfizer's vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds, promising news tonight on Moderna's vaccine in younger children. The company reporting a strong immune response in kids 6 to 11. Oh, that doesn't hurt at all. At just one half the adult dose, two shots given 28 days apart produced one and a half times the antibodies seen in young adults. And like Pfizer, Moderna says its vaccine was safe in the younger group with mild side effects like headache, sore arm, fever, and fatigue. As pediatricians who care for these kids, we want to find a solution, and it is a miracle that we potentially have one. 28 million children could be eligible for a Pfizer shot as early as Thursday, November 4th, after an expected green light from the FDA and CDC. The Pfizer vaccine found to be nearly 91% effective in 5 to 11-year-olds. Pediatrician Amanda Dropik enrolled all four of her children in the Pfizer trial. If it's something that I can prevent with a vaccine that's both safe and effective, um, that's my job to protect my kids and other people's kids to the best of my ability. 11-year-old Eli and 9-year-old Lila say they'll encourage their friends to get vaccinated. They should definitely get vaccinated and like... It really doesn't hurt, and like it's definitely worth it, even if you do get a few side effects. Just as soon as the vaccine is authorized for 5 to 11-year-olds, one, two, three. The White House says millions of doses will ship out, so they are ready at doctor's offices, children's hospitals, pharmacies, and clinics. For a lot of parents, they don't get time off work, so if you want an appointment that works for you, I don't think it's too soon to, to call up and, and, and get in line. And Ariel Reshef joins us now. Ariel, all eyes are on tomorrow's FDA panel meeting. They're meeting about the Pfizer vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds, of course. Walk us through the next steps here. Well, Stephanie, that FDA panel is expected to make its decision by the end of tomorrow. And if the FDA gives the green light, then the CDC could sign off by next Wednesday, which means we could see some of these younger children getting shots in arms by the end of next week. Steph? It's what a lot of parents have been waiting for. Thank you so much, Ariel. Now to Facebook, which is facing new criticism tonight. The former Facebook data scientist turned whistleblower testified before the British Parliament saying the social media giant chooses growth and profit over safety. And the new details of Facebook's actions around the events of January 6. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. A leak of thousands of pages of internal documents tonight raising more questions about Facebook and whether the social media giant has fueled hate. Facebook whistleblower Francis Hogan provided redacted documents to Congress, ABC News and 16 other news outlets obtaining a copy of the files. Facebook makes more money when you consume more content. Hogan, who testified before Congress earlier this month, spoke today in front of the British Parliament. It pushes you to the extremes and it fans hate. Right. Anger and hate is the easiest way to grow on Facebook. A set of documents showing that restrictions deployed by Facebook to limit potential harmful content and mitigate violence were rolled back after the 2020 election. And on January 6th, the day of the insurrection, an internal report showed that posts calling for violence and incitement surged alarmingly. User reports of false news hitting nearly 40,000 per hour. A set of documents suggesting that restrictions deployed by Facebook to limit potential harmful content and mitigate violence were rolled back after the 2020 election. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has responded to the accusations in a post saying, the argument that we deliberately push content that makes people angry for profit is deeply illogical. Mark Zuckerberg there responding to all of this. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, tell us more about how Facebook is responding to these allegations at this time. Stephanie, Facebook says it's working to reduce inflammatory content and to hunt for people who continually break the rules. And today in an earnings meeting, Zuckerberg reportedly said he's looking to focus on a younger audience rather than a broader, older one. Stephanie. All right, Pierre Thomas there for us. Thank you so much. Now to the nation's capital and the latest on those infrastructure talks. President Biden's agenda is facing a critical week as Democrats look to hammer out a deal on far-reaching social spending. ABC's Rachel Scott visited a community in Mississippi where roads and bridges have fallen into disrepair and has this report. Tonight, President Biden urging his party to strike a deal before he leaves to Europe on Thursday, hoping to tout his domestic agenda on the world stage. Think you'll have a plan before Wednesday? 
grace of God and the goodwill of neighbors. Biden summoning moderate holdout Senator Joe Manchin and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to his home in Delaware this weekend to get it across the finish line. It was a very good meeting. No one ever said passing transformational legislation like this would be easy. But we are on track. But they are not there yet. Today, Manchin said he still has a lot of concerns. One of them, Medicaid expansion for hearing, vision, and dental. And you've got to stabilize that first before you look at basically expansion. So if we're not being fiscally responsible, that's really concerning. He also takes issues with the climate change provisions, pushing the president to back away from a key goal just days before he attends a summit on global warming. This country has to remain energy independent, but we have to do it better and cleaner than anybody else. That's only one part of Biden's agenda. The other is the $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package to rebuild the nation's roads and bridges. It's already passed the Senate, but House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has refused to bring it to the floor until they reach an agreement on the social spending bill, too. It could spell hope for farmers in the South if it passes. People live on the other side of that bridge. Not only does it affect us getting our crop out, but it affects the normal everyday you know, business of Mississippi. While Congress negotiates, vital infrastructure continues to break down. In rural Mississippi, bridges and roads that facilitate business and recreation are in dire need of help. So this bridge is right in the middle of Jeffrey's farm. It's short, only about 100 yards, but he needs it to access the other 250 acres on the other side. The only problem is it's crumbling and it's now been closed for months. What is your message to lawmakers about funding bridges like these to be repaired? We just need a steady stream of funding, you know, a consistent yearly part of the budget to maintain them. Lawmakers saying over a thousand bridges in Mississippi are in poor condition. Some of them have been closed for years, waiting for someone to come and fix them. So the bridge has been closed down for two or three years. Right. And you have the parts to fix it literally sitting feet away. That's right. Yeah, the parts have been here for six months. They've been here all summer. These farmers say that because of those delays, a five minute trip can now take longer than an hour. You have no other option. Yeah, that's it. Just drive around. So we'll continue doing until they fix the bridge. Mitchell says he's not holding his breath for any relief. How long do you think it will take for that bridge to be repaired? Five or six years. Five or six years. You don't have a lot of confidence. No, but I mean, five or six years. Why? It's only been closed two months. Why do you think it'll take that long? You ever seen the government do anything fast? We're used to waiting, so, you know, we're accustomed to it. You just have gotten used to waiting. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, honestly, you know when you live in a rural area that you're not going to have, you may not have everything in a rural area that you have in a more populated area. Mitchell believes the local government should be collecting more tolls and other incomes to make these repairs. We just don't have the money. You know, we don't have a steady source of income to, to up, you know, keep the upkeep on our roads and bridges. He says that the current law benefits cities over rural communities and that his region needs federal funding to solve its infrastructure problems now. I just need a bridge. And we all do, you know, it's not just me. So much work there still needs to be done. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. I'm joined now by progressive Congressman Andy Levin of Michigan. Thanks so much for being here. Democratic leaders seem to be optimistic that an agreement on a deal can be reached this week before the president travels overseas. How confident are you that those final details can actually come together before the president is on the world stage? You know, Stephanie, we are down to negotiating uh, the last several items, and I think we can do it. I mean, I, I can't guarantee you it'll happen, but I feel really confident that we're going to get it done. And those folks who need bridges and they need infrastructure, it is on the way. We're going to pass both the Build Back Better Act and the bipartisan infrastructure bill together. Uh, some welcomed words for those farmers there in Mississippi. But as you know, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia has opposed some of the climate provisions in this bill. As President Biden heads overseas for this major climate conference next week, can you say that what's still remaining in this bill on efforts to reduce carbon emissions will go far enough in showing the U.S. is taking a lead on this issue? I'll say two things, Stephanie. It will go far enough to show the U.S. is taking the lead, and it won't go nearly far enough, not close. 
we have to change everything about the way we move, about the way we live, about the way we manufacture things, in, in about land use, about agriculture. And so Joe Manchin or no Joe Manchin, life on earth as we know it depends on comprehensive change. So we'll get a bunch of it done right now, like the most we ever have, and then we're gonna keep on going. And every two years, this Congress changes and gets more climate change progressive, and that's gonna to continue to happen in the years ahead. Let's talk about some of the other specifics. The U.S. is one of only six countries with no national paid leave, but paid leave has been scaled back from 12 weeks to four weeks, and, and even that's not certain to make it in. Progressives have also pushed for expansion of Medicare benefits, but it doesn't appear that it'll survive. So I have to ask, are progressives simply giving up too much from your original $3.5 trillion proposal in order to get a deal? Well, let me tell you how much progressives have compromised, Stephanie. I mean, our proposal was $6 trillion. The $3.5 trillion proposal was not the progressive proposal. It was Joseph R. Biden's proposal, the president of the United States. And we backed him. And we still think that we should pass a fulsome measure of his proposal. So we are still in there right to the last minute fighting to include vision and hearing and dental for seniors and to include paid family leave. As you say, we don't want to be one of just a few countries in the whole world that doesn't allow workers some paid time off if their own health or the health of their children or you know elderly parents requires them to, to deal with family matters. So we're gonna keep pressing for the best possible package we can get. I can tell you this, what we end up with will be transformative for the American people. And when you think of the last four years when the one big accomplishment was slashing the taxes of the very richest people, we've already delivered a lot for people in the American Rescue Plan. We're gonna build on that with this bipartisan infrastructure plan and the Build Back Better, which will have childcare for everybody, universal pre-K, help with education, workforce training. Uh, it's gonna have a lot in it that's fantastic for the American people, and it won't have everything we want. I can tell you that, and we'll just keep on fighting for more. Yep, and that bill's already lost a couple of the different packages, but let's stick with the cost. President Biden has repeated a bottom line number of $1.75 trillion, while Senator Joe Manchin hasn't seemed to budge from saying he won't support anything over $1.5 trillion. If that's where this bill lands, should progressives sign on, or do you still have any leverage to push for more? You know, nothing is final until there's a final deal altogether. So we are still absolutely in there duking it out. Look, on my way into D.C. today, I was met at the airport by student activists cheering me on to keep community college in there. You know, that's my bill, the free community college, uh, uh, you know, bill. And most of the press is reporting that's a lost cause. The president has said how difficult it is. But we actually um, have, you know, of the senators who've had trouble with it, we've got one on board and we have one more to go. So right to the last minute, we're fighting for uh, the, the best package we can get for America's kids, America's workers, American families. And, you and uh, we're, you know, right to the finish line, we're going to fight to make this the, the package that helps American families breathe and not have to live paycheck to paycheck. Helps women get in back in the game of the economy. You know, you've seen, Stephanie, that last September, 865,000 women left the workforce. This September, another 300,000 left the workforce. Until we get these child care and, and, and elder care and pre-K uh, provisions in there, you know, women just are taking such a burden of, of you know, taking care of, of the vulnerable people in their families and in our society, we need to help them have what they need to get back to work and make our economy as productive as it can be and to grow as much as it can. Absolutely. So many women leaving the workforce in this last year. And you mentioned community college, the president the other day saying that he doubts it'll make it in the bill, but that he's hopeful and he's insisting that it does stay in there. But uh, Democrats have insisted that this bill will be paid for. But it looks like raising corporate tax rates is no longer on the table. So are you confident the details can come together to pay for this proposal without adding to the deficit? 
You know, we have been for uh, paying for 100% of this bill from the beginning. And even when progressives were talking about $6 trillion in investments in our people, we were talking about paying for the whole thing. Let the wealthiest people and the biggest corporations at long last pay their fair share of taxes, empower the IRS to collect what wealthy people owe. I mean, we are ready to do that. I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't know what you think, Stephanie, but I think it's really interesting that people were saying, oh, don't raise rates, don't raise rates. Just a few people in, in the Democratic caucus in the House and Senate. And then we end up talking about uh, you know, a billionaire's tax and a multi, 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 multi millionaire tax. I'm for that. You know, that was Senator Warren's proposal. I went to, you know, New Hampshire, Iowa, Nevada, and California for her. You know, I'm a big bat, I was a proponent of that. But that is now on the table. So, what, whichever way it works, the key thing is this that we need to invest in the American people and we need to pay for it in a way that makes our society more just as well by chipping away at the incredible wealth and income inequality that's grown up in this country. So whether it's raising rates on the on corporations and, and wealthy people in terms of their tax rates, or it's a, a tax on the growth of assets, uh, either way, we will find a way to pay for it. And it's so important that we do so. It certainly is, and it's all very interesting to watch. We'll see how it all plays out. Democratic Congressman Andy Levin, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Take care. When we come back, the chilling discovery. Police finding three children abandoned inside a home and another child who had been dead for a year. How could this happen? And production still on hold after that deadly movie set shooting. And we have so many questions. We'll speak to someone in charge of prop weapons. But up next, our journey to Siberia to watch the slow motion melt that is exposing mammoths fur and all while possibly releasing carbons that could alter our world even more this is what being live is Freeze all about this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter we're on an urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. Okay. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television.
The UN says despite COVID lockdowns, climate heating greenhouse gases hit record levels back in 2020. Carbon dioxide concentrations are now 50% higher than they were before the Industrial Revolution. Methane levels have more than doubled since 1750. Scientists say as the world's leaders prepare to meet, this is a stark warning that we are way off course if we want to live on a planet that continues to have favorable conditions for us to remain on it. And that's one of the reasons we were so interested in the Russian region of Siberia. In the winter, it can be one of the coldest places on Earth, and because of that, even in the summers, its ground is often permanently frozen. But in recent years, there has been a change that has exposed ancient animals, altered its landscape, and as Patrick Reville reports, if the permafrost melt there accelerates, it will add to the planet's climate crisis. We're about to be shown something amazing. We are in Siberia in a walk-in fridge with an intact extinct species. The remains of a mammoth, 28,000 year old mammoth. When they found it, it was so well preserved that there was still fur on it. The laboratory of Yakutia's Lazarev Mammoth Museum specializes in making finds like these. Ice Age creatures extraordinarily well preserved. And there's a reason these discoveries are found here. Two thirds of Russia is covered by something called permafrost, permanently frozen ground. The icy soil preserves ancient animals incredibly well. But we were in Yakutia this summer, nearly 3,000 miles from Moscow, because climate change is changing Siberia. Its frozen ground is starting to melt, and it potentially has huge consequences for the rest of the planet. Here, some of the transformations being wrought by climate change are already visible in front of our eyes. The region is one of the coldest inhabited places on Earth. In winter, temperatures routinely hit below minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But in the past two decades, it's been rapidly warming, estimated two and a half times faster than the global average. To see what permafrost looks like, we go underground. You can feel the cold radiating out of here straight away. It is cold immediately. Here at Yakutia's Permafrost Institute, they've dug a laboratory into the permafrost itself. We're about 12 meters underground here in the permafrost, and it's cold. It's about minus five, minus six. This is uh, permafrost. This is permafrost. Fro frozen sand. It's like concrete. But with average temperatures in Yakutia now up to three degrees Celsius warmer, in many places the permafrost is starting to thaw. Pyotr Yefremov, a scientist from the Institute, has been measuring permafrost for three decades, and he's seen dramatic changes. So here, there are basically thermometers inserted into the ground. They go down about 10 meters, and they measure the temperature of the permafrost. And when it was first put in about 15 years ago, it was showing that the temperature in the summer was about minus three down in the permafrost. <coughs> but now, 15 years later, it's about only minus one down there. So you can see already how much the temperature has changed in that relatively short period. That warming is literally reshaping the landscape. As permafrost retreats, it leaves a hollow space under the ground. As the top earth starts to fall in, it makes these strange bulges and mounds what was once flat land now looks like this. This plot of land was very flat. In 1994, we played football, volleyball on it. Some scientists predict if temperatures continue on their present trajectory, from 10 to 30% of permafrost will be thawing within the next few decades. That thawing has potentially huge consequences. There are fears that as the permafrost melts, and ground starts to cave in, roads and buildings across Siberia will be at risk of collapse. Yeah, I mean, so the floor has just basically collapsed in here. We're standing directly on the ground now, and that's, yeah, the floor has just fallen apart. This building is slowly collapsing. Fyodor Markov, though, still lives in the building. The house is shaking, he says. Markov is a sculptor of mammoth bone. He's one of Yakutia's most celebrated craftsmen, but his home has already been declared unsafe. 
And right now, he has nowhere else to go. Back then in my childhood, summer was summer, winter was winter. Everything was good. Now it's become dangerous. Now we're starting to get scared. For this growing generation, it's very dangerous. We're leaving this land in such a state. The melting permafrost poses a potential threat far beyond Russia. As it melts, it releases the greenhouse gases, methane and CO2. Some scientists fear that if that continues, the hundreds of billions of tons of gases contained within it could begin to contribute to global warming. For now, though, those living in Yakutia are already having to learn to live on the unstable ground beneath them. Patrick Rival in Yakutsk, Russia, for ABC News. So eye-opening to see that landscape change as it has. Our thanks to Patrick for that report. Still ahead here on Prime, the dramatic surge in hate crimes, particularly against Asian Americans, what the latest data reveals. And the car rental company going big on electric cars. And on the heels of Idaho, yet another shooting in America. We take a look at gun violence by the numbers. But first, our post of the day, rapper Megan the Stallion posing for her college graduation picture. Congrats. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was gonna say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. Being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. Now to gun deaths in America. ABC News has launched a multi-part digital series, Rethinking Gun Violence, where we examine the levels of gun violence in the U.S. and what can be done about it. Tonight, a look at some staggering data by the numbers. At least 351 people were killed by a gun in this country in just the past week. At least 741 more were injured. More than 74,000. That was the number of gun homicides from 2015 and 2019, according to the CDC. While mass shootings 
wounds got a lot of attention. They represented less than 3% of those killings. 57% of the victims were African Americans, and black men in particular are two times as likely as white men to die by firearms. And while more than 50% of gun homicides took place in America's most populated cities, about half did not. What often doesn't get as much attention is that more than 60% of gun deaths are by suicide. 85% of these victims are white Americans and they take place throughout the country. However we present this grim data, gun violence is of course an ongoing national tragedy. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime, the toll gun violence is taking on America's youth. And can you guess how much these sneakers sold for? But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people so squeezing into the bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Millions of American children could soon be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. A green light for Pfizer's shot expected any day now. It's entirely possible, if not very likely, that vaccines will be available for children from 5 to 11 within the first week or two of November. At one-third the adult dose, Pfizer says its trial of more than 2,200 children ages 5 to 11 showed the vaccine was nearly 91% effective at preventing symptomatic disease, and there were no cases of severe side effects. Today, Moderna saying its vaccine for children 6 to 11 shows a strong immune response and appears safe. The company planning to submit its data to the FDA soon. A horrific discovery near Houston. Three children between 7 and 15 years old found abandoned inside an apartment along with the remains of another child. The mother and her boyfriend are thought to have left the apartment months ago. Sheriff Ed Gonzalez says it isn't clear where the children were getting food, but... It appears these kids have been here for a while, um, and so we need to find out exactly what happened and... and you know, get to the bottom. The eldest called police to say his nine-year-old brother had been dead for a year. His siblings had been living with the corpse until the oldest called for help on Sunday. The mother is being questioned. The number of people being attacked based on race spiked dramatically last year, according to new crime data reported to the FBI. There were at least 11,126 victims of hate crime reported to the Bureau in 2020, compared to 8,552 the previous year, a 30% increase. The majority of race-related attacks targeted African Americans, a group which saw a stunning nearly 63% jump in attacks against them and their property in comparison to 2019. Some law enforcement officials say the rise in hate could be attributed to racial tensions in the aftermath of George Floyd, the stress and ignorance created by COVID-19. 
Hertz expanding its fleet of electric cars, the company ordering 100,000 Teslas, the single largest order of electric vehicles. Hertz hopes the first sedans will be available to rent next month. The deal briefly pushed Tesla's value above $1 trillion. The increase also added $23.7 billion to the net worth of Tesla CEO Elon Musk, the world's richest man. He's now worth just over $253 billion, according to Forbes. For over a decade, he was TV's most beloved barista. And there's nobody to hug! <laughs> James Michael Tyler, the actor who played Gunther on all 10 seasons of Friends. Tyler was originally cast as an extra for just a few episodes, simply because he knew how to work an espresso machine. But by the series' end in 2004, he'd appeared in over 150 episodes. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2018, but of course he continued making time for his friends, even appearing via Zoom on the reunion special a few months back. Jennifer Aniston posting on Instagram, friends would not have been the same without you. Thank you for the laughter you brought to the show and to all of our lives. You will be so missed. A record-setting auction for Sotheby's this past Sunday. Michael Jordan's 1984 shoes or the Nike Airship sold for nearly one and a half million dollars. The first pair of sneakers to ever sell for one million dollars at an auction. Red and white, the signed sneakers are from Jordan's fifth NBA game in his rookie season. That same year, Nike and Jordan created his signature collection of shoes and clothing, which brings Nike billions of dollars every year. Tonight, gun violence in Philadelphia is taking a heavy toll on the city's youth. Some students say their commute to school is like passing through a war zone. Now, local educators are taking matters into their own hands. Here's ABC's Zachary Keish. There's a war going on in these streets, and none of us are safe. This morning, neighborhoods like this one in North Philly are taking cover from the gun violence ravaging their community. Students have been forced to get creative with the ways they travel to and from school. They're walking in groups. They're looking for people to pick them up and take them to school. Students stay in school because they don't feel like they can get home safely afterwards. Leano Dunn is a principal at Simon Gratz Mastery Charter School. Three students from the school were shot and killed last month, losing a total of nine kids in just the last year. Dunn reading a heart-wrenching text message he received from a student at a rally last week. I just lost four friends in a month. Why do we just live to die? It's like there is no way out of this. I met with a group of high school seniors juggling the pressures of environment while also pursuing a college education. This should not be, this should not be normal for us. I don't walk to school or walk back. My mom makes me drive. Um, the environment is a, it's a hostile environment. It's a war zone. Since 2015, more than 10,000 people have been shot in Philadelphia. Three out of four of those were black males. And in just the last year, black males made up more than 80% of the homicide victims in the city. I've lost a, a lot of great friends. I've lost family members. Experts point to a rise in gun sales and the stresses and pressures associated with lockdown. Dunn is now calling on city leaders, telling me he has not seen a legitimate plan for change. What do they not have in common is the color of their skin. And students should not have to fight to change systems. It's not their responsibility to fix it. Since July, more than 350 participants have joined Therapy Over Revenge, a program designed to teach teenagers and their families the skills for grounded decision-making and coping mechanisms for loss. They're kind of in a point where they're afraid to go to school or they're afraid to even leave the house. Um, and if they are not afraid or pretending like they're not afraid, they're going out and they have, they're armed and ready for war. The students show incredible resilience and desire to relish in the good, but they say they've been hardened. For us, it was to not show weakness. So being able to tell someone how you're feeling is kind of like, should I trust you? You still have to think about what can I do to make sure that I'm not in that situation or what can I do to make sure that my future and my life are set so I could get out of the city. 
so tough to hear those students talk about what they go through. Our thanks to Zachary Keish. Next to the new details emerging about the fatal shooting on the set of the movie Rust. The cast and crew providing eyewitness accounts and affidavits to investigators. The weapon reportedly set up by the armorer for the film, but they say it was the assistant director who handed it to actor Alec Baldwin. ABC's Kaylee Hartung has the latest on the investigation. Tonight, new eyewitness accounts are giving a more detailed picture of what happened in this chapel moments before an up-and-coming cinematographer was fatally wounded on the movie set of Rust. So was it loaded with a real bullet or one? I, I cannot tell you that. In search warrants obtained from authorities in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the film's director, Joel Souza, telling investigators Alec Baldwin was sitting in a church pew preparing for a scene. As he practiced drawing his weapon, Baldwin pointing the revolver towards the camera lens. Souza says he was standing behind behind that camera, looking over the shoulder of cinematographer Helena Hutchins when he heard what sounded like a whip and then loud pop. A projectile fired, striking and killing Hutchins, then piercing Souza in the shoulder. A cameraman telling investigators there was no video or audio being recorded at that time. An affidavit saying that the gun was one of three prop guns set up by the armorer Hannah Gutierrez Reed and that assistant director Dave Halls grabbed the gun off a cart outside the church, then handed it to Baldwin on set yelling cold gun, indicating to everyone there that the prop gun did not have any live rounds, which the AD told investigators he believed to be true. Industry safety standards ban live ammunition from movie sets. Sousa telling investigators that firearm safety protocol on set was for Gutierrez Reed to inspect a gun, then Halls, before he would hand it over to an actor. That chain of command is usually the first AD and the armorer and the actor, and that's usually the people that, that interact with that gun. But the first AD won't be touching the gun, they won't be picking the gun up off of a cart. As armorer, 24-year-old Gutierrez Reed was responsible for all weapons on set. Six weeks ago on a podcast, she described how nervous she was learning her trade. I kind of just caught on by myself. I think loading blanks was like the scariest thing to me because I was like, oh, I don't know anything about it. Tonight, the head of Russ Electrical Department calling out the producers in a post on Facebook, writing he worked with Hutchins on almost all of her films and that he believes her death was the fault of negligence and unprofessionalism. So many questions still about how this could have happened. Kaylee Hartung joins us from outside the Santa Fe Sheriff's Department. Kaylee, the film's production company, has said they are fully cooperating with the investigation. But what does this mean for the future of this film? Well, Stephanie, we just obtained a letter from the film's production company sent to the entire cast and crew saying they are wrapping production on the set here in New Mexico at least until investigations are over. Now, no charges have been filed yet in connection with the shooting, but the district attorney has said he is not ruling anything out, and we expect to hear from him before the cameras for the first time on Wednesday. Stephanie. All right, pausing production indefinitely. Thank you so much, Kaylee. For more, let's bring in a Hollywood industry veteran who has supervised guns and ammunition in movies and TV productions for more than 20 years. Larry Zanoff has been the armorer on such projects like Westworld, Captain America, Civil War, and Spider-Man Homecoming. He also works for independent studio services in Los Angeles in their weapons department. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we talk about what might have happened on the set of Rust last week, help us to understand the protocols and procedures around handling guns as props. How does it work and who makes sure it goes according to plan? Well, the industry standards for handling firearms and blank ammunition on set are actually very stringent. Uh, safety bullet number one dictates all of the actions that we take with firearms and the blanks, how they're supposed to be secured, how they're supposed to be loaded and handled. Uh, the prop master and or the armorer uh, are the people that are responsible on set for firearms. And they would have chain of custody the entire time that the firearms are outside of any kind of lockup box or safe. Um, they, of course, interact with the rest of the crew. They interact with the first AD, the first assistant director, which is the most important safety person on the set. Um, they would be indicated to bring the guns onto set by the first AD, whether we were going to use what we call a cold gun or a hot gun on set. Of course, a cold gun would be totally unloaded, nothing in it. A hot gun would be one loaded with a blank and ready to do gunfire. Uh, the guns should not get loaded until the first AD directs the armorer 
to load the specific gun. Uh, so the, 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 the guidelines are there. The assistant director allegedly yelled out cold gun uh, before he handed it to uh, actor Alec Baldwin. Of course, we're still learning more about what happened there on the set. But there are reports that some of Rust crew members walked off the set the morning of the shooting due to a labor dispute and backups were brought in to replace them. What kind of training do armorers and prop masters need to have and how much experience do they need to do that job safely? Well, you know, the, the movie set is very fluid and the types of props that are being used change from scene to scene. So you need to have a person that has the correct training on those specific props. Uh, so training under someone who is much more experienced than yourself is usually how these um, individuals progress and advance their careers in the film industry. And we don't know if it was an actual live bullet that killed the director of photography, Helena Hutchins, but can you explain what is typically used when shooting a scene with gunfire to make sure that it looks realistic but that no one is injured? Sure. Safety guideline number one, which again governs all firearms and blank ammunition on set, uh, clearly stipulates that no live ammunition is allowed on a television or film set. What we use are blanks. There will be smoke, there will be a muzzle flash, there will be an audible bang sound to it in order to simulate the gunfire, but there is no projectile in a blank that can go flying down range. And then of course there's editing that could be done in post-production to give that effect of live fire as well. Now, there are reports that three days before Alec Baldwin fired the gun that shot the cinematographer and the director, another gun had gone off on the set. Is that unusual? And as the armorer, what do you do if that happens? Well, there, there's really only two ways that you could have a firearm go off like that. One would be, let's say that the firearm became damaged in some way. It was mechanically unsound. Uh, in that particular case, if, if the gun went off when it was not supposed to, the armorer and prop master should immediately pull the firearm off set, have it inspected, make sure that it was mechanically uh, functioning correctly so that that kind of thing should not happen on set. In other words, guns going off accidentally is very abnormal. Uh, the other way that it goes off when it was not intended is if the operator pulls the trigger at the wrong time, then that becomes a matter of training. So you would pull that particular actor or stunt person aside and say, hey, look, remember, these are the safety protocols. You're only supposed to pull the trigger when you're given the specific cue for doing the gunfire. Some in Hollywood have called for an end to using live guns. And even one TV show, The Rookie, on our network, ABC, has ended the practice. Why not end the use of live guns if there are other ways to get that effect on film? Well, I think actually the reason is that there is no other way to get that effect on film in a truly believable way. Obviously, something went terribly wrong in this particular incident. Uh, it needs to be investigated. Law enforcement is investigating right now. And when they come out with their determination of exactly what happened, I'm fairly confident that we'll see that the actual industry guidelines were not being followed. The investigation into exactly what happened on that set will continue. We know that the production of the movie has been put on pause. We'll be watching it. Larry, thank you so much for your time and for your insight. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at how this Turkish diver tried to raise awareness for breast cancer. She is a multiple world record holder free diver, and she put a pink tool on her wrist in solidarity for the cause. You see it there. It looks lovely. Tomorrow, she will attempt to break the men's and women's world records in the 100 meters free dive in a single breath. Well, that is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
coming up in the next hour. We're staying on top of a few things, including the supply chain crisis. But what are companies doing to make sure we get what we pay for in time? We take a closer look. And the big power players are now out in the Virginia governor's race. What that state's election may hint at how the broader electorate feels about where things stand. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh, this is the moment. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Encouraging news in the fight against COVID. Moderna says a low dose of their vaccine was safe and effective in children ages 6 to 11. They used a half dose of the adult vaccine spaced 28 days apart. And tomorrow, an FDA advisory panel will consider Pfizer's vaccine for children 5 to 11. That could be given the green light by the first week in November. A leak of a thousand pages of Facebook internal documents is raising even more questions about whether or not the social media giant has fueled hate. A Facebook whistleblower provided the redacted documents to Congress and ABC News was among the outlets who have now seen the files. Francis Haugen, that whistleblower today testified in front of the British Parliament saying the platform pushes people to the extremes and fans hate. Mark Zuckerberg has responded calling the claims his company Company pushes content that makes people angry for profit deeply illogical. And severe storms have been wreaking havoc in the West. Parts of drought ravaged California saw historic rain over the weekend. And at least 12 states from California to Colorado are under flood watches, wind alerts, and winter weather alerts. Meanwhile, the Northeast bracing for a possible nor'easter to bring heavy rain and strong winds late tonight into Tuesday. Now to yet another deadly mass shooting as the country's gun crisis continues. All this month, we're looking at gun violence in America. At least 351 killed by gun violence in just the past week. Tonight, authorities in Boise, Idaho say at least six people were shot, including a police officer at a mall. One suspect is in custody tonight. Here's ABC's Kena Whitworth. Tonight, a deadly shooting sending shoppers running for their lives inside this Idaho mall. Shooting at Boise Town Square 350 North Milwaukee 780 for the security officer. Police say two people were killed inside the city's largest shopping mall. The primary suspect may ran by the Dave and Busters wearing dark clothes, also had all black and wearing a backpack. One store worker telling us mall security alerted her and other employees to the shooting. She says they and about a dozen customers then rushed to the back room to hide from the gunman. We went to the pretzel stand to get some pretzels and all of a sudden we heard gunshots. Officers methodically going store by store searching for victims. Authorities now confirming at least one person is in custody. Our thanks to Kana for that update. Now to the supply chain crisis. With the holidays quickly approaching, Amazon is adding more planes while FedEx, UPS, and the U.S. Postal Service are hiring thousands more workers. But will it be enough? Here's ABC's transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. 
Tonight, Amazon saying it's taking action to offset the growing supply chain crisis. We spend the full year thinking about kind of how do we get ready for the holiday season. Uh, this year especially, and with the pandemic, it's been uh, more challenging than, than most. The retail giant says it has increased the number of ports of entry it uses by 50 percent, doubled its capacity to process containers at ports, and will expand its fleet of Amazon cargo planes to 85 later this season. We've added airplanes. We've added trailers, we've added trucks, we've added vans. And so it allows us to just kind of, how do we optimize our network for customers? The U.S. Postal Service, FedEx and UPS also looking for solutions to the crisis, boosting capacity and hiring thousands more workers. The Postmaster General telling the Wall Street Journal, quote, we're going to kill it this season. Severe weather like we've seen in the past 24 hours impacting cargo ships stranded off bottlenecked ports on the West Coast. A massive fire breaking out on this cargo ship near Victoria, Canada, after dozens of its shipping containers plummeted into the ocean. And with all the trouble off the coast, secondary ports in cities like Miami now looking to draw more business to their shores. And Stephanie, here on one of Amazon's cargo ramps, the company says it plans to have those 85 planes in the air by December. Stephanie? All right, our thanks to Gio Benitez. Now to a judicial inquiry into the New York police killing of Eric Gardner back in 2014. As you may remember, Gardner was suspected by two police officers of selling untaxed cigarettes. As one of the officers used a prohibited chokehold, Gardner said 11 times the words, I can't breathe, before falling unconscious. He was declared dead at the hospital, and those final words, I can't breathe, became a national rallying cry. For more on what's happening now in this case, we bring in ABC's Aaron Katursky. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks studio this evening. This tragic killing happened so many years ago, but tell us what this inquiry is about. Yeah, it's really stunning to have all of this coming back to the fore when so many other black men have suffered the same fate as, as Eric Garner. But for a long time, his family has pushed for more transparency. For all we know about Eric Garner's death, as you described it, the unauthorized chokehold, the loose cigarettes, uh, the family believes that the public doesn't know enough. And so they have pushed for this rather unique judicial inquiry. And the judge today, as she opened it, called it trailblazing because no one's going to get in trouble. Nobody is going to be held liable. This is merely fact-finding so that the public can have a greater sense about what happened to Eric Garner, the circumstances leading up to it, and then ultimately, as it gets toward its conclusion, the decisions that were made or not made in relation to the case. What accountability could come from this, if any? I'm not sure there's going to be any specific accountability. Officer Daniel Pantaleo, who put Garner in that unauthorized chokehold, has been fired from the department, even though he faced no criminal charges. Other officers have been disciplined. And it's those other officers who are central to this inquiry. We heard at the start from Lieutenant Christopher Bannon, uh, a supervisory lieutenant in Staten Island, where Garner was selling loose cigarettes on the street or suspected. And, and the lieutenant today, Stephanie, talked about how that had become a departmental priority, so-called quality of life type crimes, where the department called the lieutenant in and said, hey, this is a problem. And so uh, the, the idea from, from the attorneys was that maybe officers were, they went looking for this kind of crime. And then we also heard from Justin D'Amico. He was on the, the, the witness stand, the virtual witness stand, talking about the, the, the probable cause for Garner's arrest and was he really charged appropriately. And, and these are the kinds of specific questions about what led up to Garner's arrest, how was he charged, the nitty gritty that the public may not know. Aaron, thank you so much. We know you'll stay on top of this. Thanks, Stephanie. In Virginia, in just days, a high-stakes election with national implications is set to take place. Former Democratic Governor Terry McAuliffe is eyeing a comeback against first-time GOP candidate Glenn Youngkin with Donald Trump and Joe Biden looming. Our chief White House correspondent, John Carl, took a deep dive into the contest and brings us this report. Get out there. Get to work. It's crunch time in the Virginia governor's race. Joe Biden won this state by 10 points, but with just over a week until Election Day, this race is a toss-up. Terry McAuliffe, a fixture of national Democratic politics for decades and Virginia's former governor, is facing off against Republican Glenn Youngkin, a former top executive at the Carlyle Group who has never run for political office before. You need someone with some experience. Do you want tired old recycled policies 
from a tired politician? Or do you want to embrace someone new? Virginia was once a solidly conservative state, but no more. It's been 12 years since Republicans won any statewide office here at all. Over the summer, though, polls showed McAuliffe with a narrow lead, and polls now consistently show the race statistically tied. This race is about more than just Virginia. It's a key test of the current president's agenda, the shadow cast by the former president, and the first major indication of what lies ahead for the midterm elections. From Joe Biden to Barack Obama, who campaigned for McAuliffe in Richmond yesterday, McAuliffe has tapped the biggest names in the Democratic Party to give his campaign some much needed energy. You got Stacey Abrams in here, two visits by the president, visit by the former president Obama, uh, visit by the first lady, visit by the vice president. What, what, why all the, why do you need all the help? Well, we did this last time. I mean, yeah. we did the same thing in 13. Yeah. I mean, we always bring them in. This is, this is the biggest race in America. Who doesn't want to be here? For the most part, Glenn Youngkin is keeping prominent Republicans on the sidelines. He has Donald Trump's endorsement, but he hasn't done a single campaign event with Trump and rarely talks about him. Not surprising given Trump is deeply unpopular in Virginia. But Yunkin hasn't been able to avoid Trump entirely. The former president called into a recent Virginia Republican event. I hope Glenn gets in there and he'll straighten out Virginia, he'll lower taxes, do all of the things that we want a governor to do. It was an event that bizarrely included a pledge of allegiance to a flag said to be on display during the January 6th rally before the Capitol riot. McAuliffe, of course, pounced. They did Pledge of Allegiance to a flag that was used to bring down the democracy that that American flag symbolizes. Yunkin wasn't at the event and denounced the January 6th pledge. I wasn't involved in, in, in that at all. Gosh, you know, the whole idea of the, the flag thing seems, seems kind of weird to me and is wrong. Yunkin turned down repeated requests over the past several weeks for an interview with This Week. His campaign says he is doing no national interviews, although he has been a regular on one news outlet, Fox News. McAuliffe has repeatedly and relentlessly portrayed Yunkin as a clone of Donald Trump. He's a total wannabe Donald Trump. He's been endorsed by Donald Trump four times. Terry, you just made folks in Las Vegas a lot of money. There's an over and under tonight on how many times you're going to say Donald Trump. And it was 10 and you just busted through it. You're running well, against Glenn Youngkin. Youngkin. He's not Donald Trump, right? I mean, you're not running against Donald Trump. You're running against Glenn Youngkin. No, but I'm running against Trump's divisive culture wars, his divisive politics. I am running against Trump policies. You bet I am. Glenn Youngkin has adopted every one of Donald Trump's divisive politics. This election here in Virginia, I think, sets the tone for this state for the next decade, and I think it's a really important message for this country. McAuliffe has suggested his struggles to put up a big lead are a reflection of Joe Biden's troubles. We are facing a lot of headwinds from Washington. As you know, the president is unpopular today, unfortunately, here in Virginia. So we have got to plow through. But McAuliffe caused some of his own troubles in a recent debate on the issue of education. When he defended his decision as governor to keep parents from pulling books, some deemed sexually explicit, out of school libraries by saying this. I'm not going to let parents come into schools bill. and actually you take books out and make their own decision. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That last line quickly made its way into a Yunkin ad. And Terry went on the attack against parents. With just days to go, there's no race in the country right now political leaders in both parties are paying more attention to than Virginia's. What is this race going to say about the midterms? I think this race is going to set the tone, I, I hope, for the Democratic Party. And so that, if you lose, it's a bad, bad sign. Well, listen, the message, we're not going to lose, Jonathan. I don't, who thinks like that? Our thanks to John Carl. Our next guest has certainly had a notable career in the legal realm, from making history as the first African-American woman to sit on the Superior Court of Northern California to having a part in ending school segregation and legalizing same-sex marriage. Judge LaDoris Hazard Cordell joins us now to discuss her new memoir titled Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It. Judge Cordell, thank you so much for being here tonight. Appreciate your time. Your story on how you became a judge is so unique. Tell us about the unexpected phone call that changed your life. 
it was a phone call from a judge. I didn't know him. And he invited me to join a pro tem judge program. Lawyers, after practicing for a certain period of time, can be a judge for a day and preside over a small claims case. And those are cases where no lawyer is involved, like what Judge Judy presides over. So I got a phone call thereafter and said, oh, your number has come up on the rotation. Do you want to come down and preside? So I did. I went down and presided over a case where two women were suing each other. And I'm just going to leave a teaser for the, those who are going to read the book and just let you know that it was the case was all about hair. And I mean, hair, hair. And uh, as a result of that case, it really got me thinking that I really wanted to be on the bench. And eventually, that's exactly what happened. Judge, that's a really good tease. <laughs> You you have you have another career for you in in TV news. So in your book, you write about the time that you defied the judicial system and officiated a same-sex marriage. You say, and I quote, "When the ban on same-sex marriage was still in full force and effect in California, I deliberately violated that ban and presided over the wedding of two women." What compelled you to take part in that ceremony? At the time, um, two women asked me to preside over the wedding, and they knew that even though I would preside over it, it wasn't going to be legal, because at the time, those marriages were not legal. But we did it as a statement to say that this law is wrong, we're going to defy it. It was a basically kind of a, 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 a mode of civil disobedience. Certainly a bold move. Now, in one of your earlier chapters, you referenced the juvenile justice system. You say that politicians, legislators, and the media promote laws that blur the lines between the treatment of juveniles and that of their adult counterparts. Explain what you mean there. Sure. Juvenile courts were set up because they are different from adults. Adult courts are basically, and we're talking criminal, uh, the criminal legal system, adult courts are primarily punitive. They're not really looking as primarily at rehabilitation. Juvenile courts were set up for rehabilitation because we believe juveniles can be redeemed if they have committed um, criminal acts. So over the years, however, times, things change, attitudes changed, and we ended up with juvenile courts that were really becoming more and more punitive, punitive as well. Many juveniles uh, are being, were being tried as adults. But in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd with Black Lives Matter, uh, people are looking anew at the juvenile justice system and trying to get it back on track to where we're looking primarily at rehabilitation and not punishment. I truly believe that all young people, with very, very, very rare exceptions, can be redeemed and can be rehabilitated. And of course, their maturity levels, of course, change over, over time right. and over the years. Now, after you left the bench in 2001, you were appointed as the independent police auditor in the city of San Jose, where you investigated violence and mental health care in the jail system. What did your investigation conclude? I was the chair of a blue ribbon commission that looked into the state of the jails in Santa Clara County, which is the fifth largest county in California, uh, in the aftermath of the death, uh, the beating death of a mentally ill inmate by three correctional officers at the jail. And what we looked at in that blue ribbon commission was how the jail functioned, how it operated, and found that so many things were broken and made over 100 recommendations to change how the jails run, in particular. Uh, the top recommendation was to have civilian oversight over the operation of the jails. Lastly, in your memoir, you offer 10 suggestions on how to effectively change areas in the broken legal system. One area you address is the recall of judges. Where do you stand on that? If judges have engaged in malfeasance, if they've committed crimes, if they've engaged in misconduct, the public has every right, voters have every right to say, we want to recall that person before that judge's term is up. But that's not how recalls generally work in this country. And basically how they work is that anytime a judge makes a decision, even if it's a lawful decision, if some people don't like it because maybe it's controversial, that judge could be recalled. And that's what happened recently here in California. My concern is that if a judge can be recalled for making a lawful decision, we're going to lose an independent judiciary, which is critical to our democracy. So I want to see recalls, if states want to have them, uh, be utilized only when judges have misbehaved, not when they've made 
lawful decisions because we don't want judges looking over their shoulders before they make decisions, worried about whether or not they're going to be recalled because somebody doesn't like what they have decided, even though that judge has followed the law. Many interesting points. Thank you so much for your time. Retired Judge LaDoris Cordell, thank you for being on our show tonight. Thank you so much, and I hope everyone reads Her Honor. It's uh, an eye-opener for everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, Her Honor. My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It is on sale tomorrow. And still to come, it is that time of the year to get scared. <laughs> Stay with us. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. We move up to the vehicle. He detonates the bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation. Vans made contact. The takedown of the bomber. Now streaming on Hulu. Please begin. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes. The Stanford dropout who appeared poised to change the world, but didn't. Her fall from grace was spectacular. Elizabeth is finally going to trial. This case will probably go down in Silicon Valley history. But to this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. If history is any indication, Elizabeth Holmes is not going down without a fight. Follow the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. The U.S. Embassy in Sudan is warning Americans to shelter in place after the military moved there to take control, placing the prime minister under arrest. After Sudan's top general announced the takeover on TV, thousands took to the streets to protest the coup just weeks before the civilian government was set to take full control. Security forces opened fire on those crowds with at least three protesters reportedly killed. France is preparing to return looted treasures to the African nation of Benin in a move that could have ramifications for other European museums. France is displaying 26 of those looted colonial era 
artifacts one last time before returning them. The wooden statues, you see some of them, some of them there. Royal thrones and sacred altars were looted by the French army 129 years ago. Benin will be building a new museum partly funded by the French government to house those works. And in the Philippines, a group of recyclers are trying to tackle the country's soaring plastic waste crisis by turning bottles, single-use bags, and wrappers clogging rivers and beaches into building materials. That group is collecting plastic waste, shredding it, and turning it into so-called eco-lumber that can be used for fencing and decking, or even to build disaster shelters. They've collected 100 tons of plastic waste since 2019. The countdown to Halloween Sunday is well underway. Haunted attractions have popped up all around the country, providing fright seekers with all the scares. Will Reeve brings us all the haunting details to get your fix this spooky season. Hair-raising haunted attractions are not for the faint of heart, and tickets for these haunts are selling out across the country. Named by USA Today as the number one haunted attraction of 2021, Cutting Edge Haunted House in Fort Worth, Texas brings 55 minutes of menacing mazes and a bone-chilling beat with this haunted drumline. How about a scavenger hunt for a demon baby? At Bennett's Curse in Baltimore, Maryland, let the tricks begin. Get frightened by Hollywood caliber makeup and effects at Netherworld in Stone Mountain, Georgia, started by a former special effects makeup artist and television producer. Legend has it that Charlie the Janitor torments at Dent Schoolhouse in Cincinnati, Ohio. This haunted building hosts quite the menacing festivity. One of the oldest attractions in America is Headless Horseman in Ulster Park, New York. This year's brave souls are walking alone in the dark through terrifying trails. And here in Denver, Colorado, the famous 13th floor haunted house. I was terrified the entire time. <laughs> giving us a behind the screams look at the heart pounding haunts. My favorite part, I have to say, is watching the actors transform once you get the makeup on them. We want to make sure that it's a quality guest experience for all. Not just that they scream, they get to have a good time, make Halloween memories. I don't know if I want to scare myself that badly, but if you're into it, you've got some options. And finally tonight, the moment between the boy who beat cancer and the greatest to ever play the game. Our Lindsay Davis reports. Tonight, the moment between father and son and Tom Brady. Oh, the little boy so excited. He's crying. He got to meet Tom Brady. That's nine-year-old Noah Reed from Highland, Utah. His father, James, right by his side. Oh, look at this. There's nothing better than a father-son like that. I mean, look at that. How Noah and his dad got to this moment was anything but easy. Noah was diagnosed with brain cancer less than a year ago. There was surgery, radiation, all the while determination, and a goal to beat cancer and see his favorite football player play in real life. Noah wearing a Tom Brady jersey throughout the treatment, watching Brady from his hospital bed after surgery, all the while getting stronger, playing catch in the hospital. And after months of treatment, his doctors now say Noah is cancer free and gave him the all clear to go to Sunday's game, wearing his jersey before the game, making a sign, carrying it into the stadium. Tom Brady helped me beat brain cancer. Brady spotting Noah in the crowd, giving him a hat and shaking his hand. Noah's head in his hands overcome. Afterwards, Brady on the moment. Obviously tough kid, man, and uh, puts a lot in perspective of what we're doing on the field. Um, in the end, it doesn't mean much compared to what so many people go through. Tonight, Noah and his dad, James, are grateful. That was amazing. I'm so blessed. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. We all are. <laughs> what a sweet little boy. I'm so glad you're feeling better, Noah, and well done, Tom Brady. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us.